we go ahead and get started. Um, Alejandro, do you want to take it away? Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Alejandro. I'm a PhD candidate at Arizona State University, and I'm here representing AGQ, the LGBTQ affinity group of AGU. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about what AGQ is. It was formed uh, this past January after the fall 2022 meeting. And the goal of the group is to foster a welcoming environment for LGBTQ AGU members um, to help build connections amongst us and to highlight some of our work. And my role in the group is to create events like this that happen year round instead of just having stuff at the fall meeting. And so this is our first one. So we're super excited for that to happen. Hi, everyone. My name is Gage Kerr. I currently work as a research scientist studying air pollution in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at George Washington University in DC. But I'm here today representing the American Meteorological Society's LGBTQ plus affinity group, which is called Coriolis. I've led Coriolis for a few years now, thanks in no small part to a really dedicated team of volunteers, many of whom are here today, and maybe you'll have a chance to meet during our breakout sessions. Coriolis, though, predates me and has existed for nearly 15 years. The largest event that we as a organization or committee sponsor every year is a reception at the AMS's annual meeting. This event usually draws about 100 people, and I thought that this last year's reception in Denver was really special because we featured opening remarks from a meteorologist turned U.S. representative named Eric Sorensen from Illinois' 17th Congressional District. Additionally, we also host events like this webinar you're attending right now. And I'm really proud that this is the third webinar that Coriolis has hosted during Pride Month, or in the case of this year, co-hosted. Yeah. And so we're just going to do a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, after Gage and I are finished with this introduction, we're going to turn things over to our moderators and our panelists for our panel discussion. Um, today's discussion panel will last until 4 p.m. Eastern time. Then we'll transition into informal breakout rooms. And these are just intended to get to know one another and they'll be randomly determined and then they'll be shuffled every 10 minutes. And then the whole event will conclude at 4.30. So I think cameras are already off, but please be sure to keep your cameras and microphones off for the panel portion of the event. And uh, you'll also notice that the event is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be made public in the future. We post probably on some YouTube channels. And at the end of the discussion, the recording will stop and the breakout rooms will not be recorded. It's also always fun to see where people are joining from and make sure that we're using correct pronouns with each other to create an inclusive environment. So if you're able to, um, and using the desktop Zoom app, I'd ask that you change your name in Zoom to reflect your institution um, as well as your pronouns. And you can do that if you go over to our participants list and uh, hold the mouse over your name and click more, and then there'll be a drop down menu where you can rename yourself. Also, if you have questions for our panelists today, you can ask them by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or on your mobile device. And uh, the panelists and moderators together will determine behind the scenes which questions uh, we'll have time to answer today. Um, and then finally, by attending this webinar, you're all agreeing to abide by the AMS and AGU codes of conduct. And I just wanna briefly summarize those now. So harassment, intimidation, or discrimination of any kind won't be tolerated at today's webinar. Harassment, intimidation, or discrimination includes offensive comments and actions related to age, gender and gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, and religion. They also include harassing photography or recording, sustained disruptions of talks or other events, inappropriate physical contact, and unwanted sexual attention. All communication today should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds. Please be inclusive and respective, be kind to others, and don't insult or put down other attendees. Folks who violate these standards of professional and respectful conduct may be asked to leave the webinar immediately and may also be subject to additional action. So now I'd like to turn things over to our two moderators and then to our three panelists for them to introduce themselves. So Dr. Coleman and Dr. Gromlich, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, Gage and Alejandro for getting us going today and for our amazing panelists, Akila, Lucas, and Mika, who will be joining us on the Zoom room. And welcome to all of you. My name is Lisa Gromlich. Um, 
I identify as queer and my pronouns are she, they. I serve as the president of the American Geophysical Union, AGU. And I'm a faculty member at the University of Washington where I recently stepped down as being Dean of the College of the Environment and currently am in a faculty position in the forestry school. I am really keen to hear your stories and take your questions and, and couldn't be happier than to be here. I'll just say by way of introduction, this is very different from when I was an assistant professor and a vice provost said to me in all sincerity, Lisa, it's okay to be gay, but just don't tell anyone. So um, that's not the advice we're gonna hear today. So Brad, take it over. Thank you, Lisa. And yeah, thanks Gage. Thanks Alejandro for being, yeah, it, it's exciting to be here um, and to see the, the, the panelists, meet the panelists earlier and, and to look at all those in the audience, you in the audience. Um, I'm an atmospheric scientist, just recently stepped down from being director of weather science at Bayer Climate Corporation, spent most of my time working in Renoa, both in OAR and the weather service. And I just thankful for the career that I was able to do and see the increasing demands on our sciences as we move ahead into the areas, especially rich, the, the risks of climate change facing both humans and our environment. Uh, I have three different priorities when I'm the AMS and under president as president. And, and one of those was DEI. I'm a, a gay man. Uh, I, I led a rather unremarkable life. Uh, went to college, went away to college. Maybe I went farther away because I was gay and I didn't want to do it too close to home, but I went away to college. I met a man. I fell in love. We're now married. We've been together 42 years. Rather uneventful. But I know that that's not what everyone, especially in, in my age group, experienced. And I benefited from a lot of heroes ahead of me and inside me that, that really paved the way. And, and so a priority has been DEI for me and where I can help. And I have learned so much already uh, through this year and meeting with people through, through uh, the, you know, the, our Coriolis and what's going on there. So I'm really excited about the day and I want to be here and help and learn so much. And I look across our panelists and these are today's heroes. They, they are going to make all of your peers uh, hopefully lead unremarkable lives as I was fortunate enough to have done uh, through my early career as a gay man. So now I think what we're going to do is meet our panelists, right? So Micah, do you wanna kick it off? Sure, hi, um, I'm Mika. Um, I think maybe a lot of you um, know me. I um, was able to, uh, y'all can hear me, right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I was able to uh, give the plenary um, talk on Thursday of AGU last in December, which was um, a highlight of my life, I would say. Um, so maybe a lot of you know me from that, but I'll just give a brief, um, for those of you who don't, synopsis of sort of my life trajectory. Um, it's been sort of uh, the opposite of, <laughs> I think, unremarkable. It's been quite interesting. And uh, uh, the trajectory is not exactly what I thought it would be. So I um, received my undergraduate degree in uh, mathematics and statistics from the University of Connecticut in 2006. Uh, I'm old. And I then went to get my PhD at um, the University of California in Irvine, um, where I worked uh, in the Department of Earth System Science um, with Dr. Jim Randerson and Dr. Charlie Zender, um, looking at the impacts between, the interactions between uh, wildfire smoke and uh, climate, specifically cloud formation and cloud physics. I took a postdoc at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where I was doing similar work, um, but using satellite data. And uh, I was doing that for a while. I transitioned from a postdoc to a research scientist, um, but I was starting to feel increasingly, um, you know, dissatisfied with the trajectory of my professional career. Um, I felt uh, like my passion and uh, my calling was really to be teaching. So I applied for some professor positions and was extremely fortunate to come across 
an interesting and extremely sort of out of the blue uh, listing where they were asking for a climate scientist to teach at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So I interviewed, um, got the offer, moved to Chicago in January of 2017 to teach climate science to undergraduate art students, um, which is really the coolest thing um, ever. My research kind of took um, a turn and I started to think about the ways that art and design can impact um, not just the communication right, of science, of climate change, but also in the construction of, of scientific knowledge and also to help us imagine um, a future sort of in the wake of the climate crisis. Um, and so that's what I've been doing. I actually am working on a very cool project right now with a master's student that involves discarded solar panels, um, <clears throat> some data about per capita contribution to climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm excited to unveil that soon. Um, as far as being queer, um, I'm a trans woman, obviously. My pronouns are she, her. It wasn't always that way. Well, I mean, it was, I guess, always that way. But um, I, for a long time, identified um, just as a gay man uh, for like 12 years. So I feel very much um, a part of the queer um, community. I came out in 2003 as gay, and I came out as trans in 2016. In fact, coming out as trans was, I think, directly related to getting this position at the School of the Art Institute. So um, it allowed me to move and also sort of realize and actualize my true identity. So I'm super excited to be here um, and I will I will stop there and I will, I guess, hot potato it to um, the next person I see is Akila. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi everybody, my name is Akila Alwan. Uh, my pronouns are she, they. I am a PhD candidate in the Earth System Science Department at Auburn University. Um, I identify as non-binary and pansexual. Um, I just married my wife in February, so I am I feel like moving into an <laughs> kind of an elder queer position. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I did my undergraduate degree in environmental science at the University of South Carolina, where I got really interested in uh, geoscience education research. Um, so I am a geoscience education researcher now. My dissertation focuses on power and belonging in the geosciences, specifically looking at racism and identity. Um, but my overall goals are basic. My overall interests are are the dynamics of power and marginalization in the geosciences in general. Um, so I, you know, I work on projects that focus on disability and accessibility, um, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, just kind of how power organizes itself in the geosciences. Um, my ultimate goal is to understand um, provide a better understanding of our historical context of power and stratification in the geosciences to ultimately create um, cultural transformation, which I think is our answer to really, um, really innovating in terms of diversity and inclusion in the geosciences. Um, and shameless plug, I'll be graduating um, next May. I just got my master's in educational research measurement and evaluation. Um, and program evaluation this May. I'll be getting my PhD in our system science next May, and am very excited to look at, um, look forward to the future for next opportunities. And so I will pass off to Lucas. Appreciate it. Um, so my name is Lucas Johansson, he and pronouns. Um, I'm a trans man, and I am currently working with Noah. Uh, so I, I I guess like, like Mika, my background is math and statistics and I, and I also graduated in 2006. So I'm right there with you. Um, but yeah, so math and statistics was my background. I, I wasn't necessarily focused on geosciences, um, but I, uh, after um, moving to Washington DC for grad school, I uh, accepted a position at the end of, of my grad school with uh, NOAA starting first as a con contractor um, and now I've been with uh, NOAA since 2009. Um, and my current position is with the fisheries in the Office of Science and Technology. And I do a lot of uh, survey statistics and statistical programming, uh, working on uh, recreational fishing statistics. 
Um, so I didn't necessarily see myself moving into the world of recreational fishing um, as an undergrad or over before, but I'm I'm very attached and um, and support the NOAA mission. I think it's a great organization to work for, and I'm, I'm happy to be there. Uh, I also, for the past uh, year, have been uh, one of the co-chairs of NOAA's LGBTQ Plus Employee Resource Group, NOAA Pride, and it has been an adventure. And uh, you know, I so I I started my career identifying as a, a, a lesbian woman or something along those lines, uh, and then um, didn't transition until. Uh, I started identifying as a trans man in 2017, so about eight years into my career at NOAA. And so it was a bit of a difficult time for me, as I'm sure you can imagine. I think especially because I had been there for so long, developed these relationships, and I was breaking kind of away from what people were, were I guess, used to. Um, but I have had a pretty good experience uh, at NOAA with my transition, a lot of wonderful supportive folks. Um, and being a part of NOAA Pride has kind of uh, helped me, I think, in a lot of ways, uh, gain a lot of confidence and um, uh, it's obviously put me, I think, kind of in front of the camera in some ways. And prior to my transition, I was not someone who was comfortable speaking out, you know, uh, being in front of the camera and talking about my identity or even my career. Um, and Post transition, I was able to, you know, get involved with NOAA Pride, helped me develop some community, and gave me a lot of leadership opportunity. Um, and it's been a wonderful experience for me. So, that is where I am now, and uh, uh, still with NOAA, 14 years later, and and happy to be there, uh, and happy to meet all of you. Well, these are great introductions. Um, once again, want to welcome people that are just now coming in. I see on my Zoom screen bottom that there's 60 people with us gathered here right now. Um, recall that you can put questions to the panel in the chat. Um, do I have that right, Alejandro and Gage? That's the best way to get questions? Yeah, the Q&A function. The Q&A function, okay. And to get us going, I often sort of, in giving talks like this, sort of describe being queer as actually being kind of a hidden superpower, that there's ways that we bring certain kinds of leadership and intuition and emotional intelligence and other ways we are that actually help us sort of build our programs in STEM and sometimes just survive. So I would love to ask the panelists, um, what about your identity or your community makes you the most proud? And how does your identity inform the kind of science or scholarship that you do? And um, just looking to see whoever pops up first. You're all muted. Who's gonna unmute here? Come on. Some Aquila. Um, yeah. thank you. So um, I travel a lot, um, you know, all of our various, you know, professional society meetings, AGU, GSA, and ABG. And I have developed this community of people who I consider friends, family, even they're like, they're kind of like work for family, but from afar, um, because they're at institutions all over the country, even all over I would say all over the globe, you know, I folks on the on the Jordy's resolution, like everywhere. Um, and we we've worked on a lot of different collaborative projects. Um, and we've we've discussed how like we feel that it's it wasn't by chance that we've met each other at these meetings because this community is really what the next wave of 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 scientists look like. Um and it's and it's so reaffirming to have this this community, not just of friends, but of like-minded scholars um, who are a, who are thinking like you, conceptualizing problems like you, want to make a difference like you, particularly when, I, I, at least for me as someone who's, you know, still early career, has limited agency in what I do as a PhD candidate, like, it can feel like, 
it can feel like you're limited in, in what you're able to accomplish, but knowing that there's other, you know, graduate students, postdocs, you know, early faculty members that that want to, you know, when I think of, you know, what Raquel and Benjamin did with um, SNC and, and what other folks are doing um, in, in ecology and in marine science and in microbiology, like seeing these affinity groups um, and knowing that th that we're no longer okay with complacency, right? Not to say that not to say that the geosciences haven't been working towards making things more inclusive for queer folks and and all folks, um, but that you know the progress that we've had it. I would argue it's in, incremental, and I think we're at a turning point now because so many of us are grounded in our identities and grounded in our experiences that we want to work together. And that's what I've experienced with my colleagues is working together, you know, writing papers, doing academia and creating meetings to collectively think about how can we be the change. And it's so empowering to be a part of that. Uh, I'll, ch I'll chime in. Thank you um, for that great question. Lisa, and also that great answer, Akila. Um, so I, you know, think about this a lot, actually, and I talk about it a lot in my public lectures when I give public lectures about this, um, or just, you know, the stuff that I talk about in general. And I think, you know, when I started my PhD in 2006, um, as far as I know, I was the only out queer identifying person in my department, in my cohort. Um, and I had been told a number of times by a number of different sort of um, colleagues and people who are older than me who had been in the field longer, um, you know, it's great, it's fine that you're queer, whatever, but this is about the science. And I just, I have grown to fundamentally reject that idea. Um, the science is being conducted and the knowledge is being constructed by people and people have identity. It's just that the default identity for science has been a particular one. And I think I know, I think we can all visualize what that one is without me having to say it. And anything that's different than that is considered a distraction, but actually it's not a distraction. In fact, that identity has always been informing the way that those people conduct their science, much in the way that our identity informs the way that that we conduct our science. And I have, I think, two examples um, of this. So the first is I teach in my class um, a course about um, science, knowing science just in general. And we talk a little bit about evolution. And um, there is a group of researchers, two groups of researchers, actually. One um, comprised mostly of cis men and one comprised mostly of cis women that observed a goal population in South America. And after observing the same goal population, right, the same behaviors, the two groups actually came to vastly different conclusions about why the goals were doing what they were doing. Um, and so this is like, th this is a very concrete example of how identity really does inform the way that we sort of construct scientific knowledge. Another example is um, specifically as a queer person, right, I, I mentioned that I teach at an art school, I'm a climate scientist, I teach at an art school. So I think about sort of ways that art and art making and design and stuff can sort of inform um, solutions to climate change, solutions to the climate change crisis, like sort of reach us emotionally, allow us to imagine and envision different futures, um, essentially building new worlds, right? And as a queer person, I'm, I think I'm intimately familiar with world building as, uh, as, a, as a really important facet of my life, in fact, a survival uh, facet of my life, right? There are some times, some days where I like, leave and I go out and I'm like, oh my God, I forgot that there are straight people in the world, um, right? Because we've constructed these like queer worlds um, that protect us, that, that bring us joy, that allow us to thrive and those sorts of things. And it's that type of queer world, world building that I think we need to draw from and employ as we build these worlds in response to climate change, right? It's not just a matter of like a policy here, a policy there, but, 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 but. we do have to change and impact the culture. And I think the way that queer people build worlds is not dissimilar from the way that we can build worlds in the wake of climate change, right? Much in the way that these worlds for queer people are a form of queer liberation, I like to think that we can also harness that same energy for a form of environmental liberation. Um, and so something that I'm, extremely proud of is how 
uh, sort of well, I, well is not the right word, but how, how wholeheartedly many people in the science community have actually embraced these ideas, right? I feel um, incredibly respected as a trans woman. And I think that it's something that I'm really, really proud of. I'm proud of the work I do. And I'm proud that I'm not ashamed to say that I'm trans, that I'm not ashamed to be queer and open. And I think that people are receptive to that. And so I'm gonna keep doing it, sorry. Um, yeah, so that's all I have to say about that. But um, maybe Lucas, if you have something that you wanted to add. I mean, those are great responses, things that I can absolutely relate to from both of you. I'm not sure how to tack on to that really, but um, you know, I think that I, I can absolutely relate to, uh, to pride in being a trans person and pride in my career and pride in, you know, um, my identity and the community that I've built. And I think that this is like how we make progress, right? Like I think that identity informs our science and it helps us to evolve our science. And, you know, I think being a trans person has, I think in a lot of ways, given me the ability to understand the depth of perspective to perspective and to challenge traditional views and traditional processes. And a lot of that carries over into every single aspect of my life, including you know, my career, my science, my communities, the people I interact with every day. Um, so I, I like to think that it helps me open my mind, consider the vastness of poss possibility. And I bring that to my career and my work every single day. And you know, just on, on more of a basic level, like before I transitioned, before I allowed myself to see who I really was, like I, I wasn't necessarily doing all those, th those things, a lot of it because I didn't have that confidence. I didn't have that voice. I didn't have that community that I really needed and wanted. And at, you know, post-transition, I've found a lot of those things and becoming involved with Noah Pride has, has been amazing. And I have so much pride for the work that we've done, you know, the way we're educating people I've given a talk on pronouns and gendered language to several different federal agencies, you know, to thousands of people across federal agencies. And it, it's scary to me, but it's also something that I take great pride in. I know that we're advancing um, not only science, but, but, but our communities, our society in general. And it feels really, really awesome to do that. I'd like to also say, for me, as a geoscience education researcher who, you know, studies the dynamics of power and belonging in the geosciences, like my research is extremely personal. I think it's hard for me to separate out, um, you know, what is because of my queerness and what is because of my blackness, what is because of my disability that the passion is. And I think it's very evident in why I'm so dedicated to doing this work. I got into geoscience education research basically from the moment I became a geoscientist, my very first day of undergrad, I always sit in the first row of my class because I won't pay attention if I don't. <laughs> and I turned around and I looked at this in my Marine Science 101 class, the rest of my classmates, about mm, probably 90, 90 kids, not a single person looked like me in any way, very homogenous room. And I don't, I was just so passionate in high school about pursuing you know, environmental science, because I knew I was good at it. I never considered, I don't know another environmental scientist. I don't know what they make, what they look like, you know, what they actually do. I just know I'm good at this. And so as I started, you know, doing, you know, some research programs, I did the Ronald McNair post-baccalaureate program. I, I realized that there's so much of the geoscience education research is doing the same kind of thing on the same kind of folks. And again, we don't know how, you know, non-binary folks fit into field, you know, experiences. We don't know, you know, the dynamics of how being gender non-conforming or transgender fits into the geosciences that is a white male dominated field. And so there's so much out there to explore. And that's what really drives me, I think, um, not to not to say I'm trying to specialize in all these various marginalized identities, but there's so many unanswered questions because we've been doing, you know, we've been, we've been having so much uh, replication in how we cite each other in my field. And I think just there's there's so many unanswered questions because there's so many um, identities that it oftentimes just have been 
under recognized. Um, and then when we also think about the complexity of the of how these intersecting identities overlap as well, there's there's so many questions there. And so I just think there's so much possibility to look into this and that's what fuels my science for me. Okay, awesome. Thank you all for those really personal, inspiring, and, and in many ways, brave stories. Uh, and thank you, Lisa, for that question. I'm sure the, the answers resonated with many people here on, on the call today. One commonality that I picked up was certainly the importance of community for each of you in, in your careers. And I'd like to uh, look a little bit more closely at our professional community. Uh, I, speaking of things to be proud of, I'm, I'm proud to be co-moderator with Lisa, uh, AGU president. I think it's unique, possibly the first, who knows, the time that the AGU president and the AMS president are both members of the LGBTQ community. So I think it's an opportunity, at least for us to look at that. And I'd really be appreciative if the panelists could share a little bit about what you would like the AG or AMS to, to do. How, what can we do? What can, how can we do it better in support of our community? And uh, Lucas, do you wanna kick it off? Uh, sure. Yeah. So I have to say I'm, I'm not incredibly familiar with AMS or AGU. So my my um, my points here might be more uh, general, but you know I think um, I think events like this, for example, are huge, right? Like I think that visibility is something that's so important uh, to helping make people feel feel comfortable, make people feel included, um, make us feel like we're welcome in places. And I think, you know, it's important to have visibility uh, across all, all, all levels, all um, of, of professions and, and whatnot. Um, at NOAA, we recently did a panel of leadership who are current and former NOAA, like high level leaders who are in the community or related to the community, connected to the community closely somehow. And like, that's something that people are asking for because that's how we, we make that community. That's how we make people feel comfortable. Um, and, you know, on, on other levels, I think, you know, continuing, uh, to educate ourselves is a huge, huge thing. Um, making sure that we aren't making assumptions, um, making sure that spaces are all inclusive, like you know, having pronouns, making sure in, in actual physical spaces there are restrooms that are inclusive, um, all kinds of things like that. Um, but yeah, I think for me, the, the things that I would just uh, push are, are the visibility and continuing to educate ourselves. Um, because there's always things to learn and we want to keep our minds open. Um, and I appreciate that y'all are doing uh, events like this and making it possible. Um, so I'll let uh, Mika and Akila talk more about specifics. But. Yeah, for me, I think the biggest thing when we consider the socio-political climate right now is consideration. Um, we think about where we're having our meetings, when we think about where we're, you know, encourage, you know, basically, particularly in person meetings, but any any of our regional, sectional, you know, gatherings being intentionally inclusive there, because right now there are places where unfortunately, as a, you know, as a queer person and, and a non-binary person, I am not able to travel my wife is like no it's not safe for you to go to these places um because um i'm i cannot guarantee and not even just as a queer person as a black person that you will come back to me um and so i think um there's a there's there's other organizations that um are are holding things in these spaces and 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 the the lack of consideration is very um hurtful to me because I want to participate but I unfortunately you know because of my identities I, it's not the the academic gains are not worth the risk to my safety um and so I definitely encourage AMS and AGU 
to consider, you know, when we're when we're thinking about our meeting, what is the what is the local legislation, what is the state legislation, what does it say um, in terms of all of the identities that we care to be inclusive towards? Um, will our members be safe to travel, enjoy um, this meeting, and return home safely? Yeah, these are all great points. Um, and, and I just wanted to add, my, my response here will be kind of bimodal. Um, sorry about that. So on the one hand, um, I can remember going to my first AGU meeting in uh, 2007, December of 2007. And I remember that I had um, one friend who was gay um, at AGU. And it was this weird sort of whisper campaign, like, hey, the gay AGU event is going to be at this bar in the Castro. Um, and it was like not formal. It was not a real thing. It was just like show up and dance. Um, and so that was, we called it Gay GU. Um, and to see the evolution from that to this makes my heart sing, honestly. To see Lisa as the president, to see Brad as a president, to see, you know, queer people leading these organizations is indicative of, I think, the sort of larger cultural shift, right? And also the, the way in which um, I think our communities like to be at least at the, towards the front of that cultural shift. And so um, like with everything, right? The things we ask of AGU and AMS, the things we need are the same things we need from the culture, right? We need respect, we need, um, we need to be um, not, exterminate, right? They're trying to sort of exterminate trans people at this point, I feel like. And so we need we need people to stand up for that. And so I guess the other sort of the 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 other bimodal part of my question um is you so I I um lovingly refer to myself as a um as a loud angry tranny. Sorry if that word offends people. Um but I call myself that right I'm a loud angry tranny and I think that um I have the agency to do that. I'm white I have a career um, and I feel really secure in my personal life and I have the privilege to be loud and angry and I am loud and angry. And the thing that I'm currently the loudest and the angriest about is people saying that they're allies but not actually being allies, right? You don't get to call yourself an ally. I get to call you an ally. <laughs> and to be an ally is more than just posting a pride flag on your Facebook, right? To be an ally is to get in fights with your friends who misgender trans people, to get, you know, to talk to your parents. Um, this is if you're, you know, if you're, if you're cis and you're het or whatever, however you identify, right? Um, you know, get in fights with your parents about why trans kids are not tearing apart the fabric of America, right? That's what I need you to do. That's what I need as, 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 as true allies. Um, and so I think what I, the thing that I, that I ask of, of everyone on this call is to really step up your cookies with the allyship. I'm sure many of you are doing an, an incredible job. I don't know most of you on, I can't even see your faces. Um, but I will just say as someone who has experienced a lot of so-called allies in my life, the minute there's a conflict with them, they'll all of a sudden say something to me like, you're mansplaining to me. It's like, oh, I thought you were an ally. That's really interesting right now, all of a sudden, right? So it's that kind of thing where um, just keep in mind that being an ally goes way beyond what you might think it means. Okay, I'm done being loud and angry for now. Thank you, Mika, Lucas, Keeling. Wow, powerful answers. Uh, yeah, really, really powerful. Uh, I, I know that DEI is a strategic priority for both societies, and, and we're working hard on, on trying to make it a safer, more welcoming environment. But to hear your personal stories, yeah, really powerful. So I, Lisa, are you set with another question? Well, I am. And this question comes from the community. Here you go, panel. To what extent has queer community you in your career? Or add some new ideas on that? I'll say it again while you're thinking. To what extent has queer community helped you in your career? I'm happy to start on this one, actually, because the queer community has helped me immensely in my career, actually. Um, 
you know, a lot of times I think, um, oh, uh, the only reason people want me to come and speak at their institution or whatever is because I'm like the 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 trans woman who um, is doing, you know, this this kind of like out of the box work. And I, it's, it's a, there's a feeling of tokenization, I guess, in many ways. Um, and I've kind of come around on that. I actually think um, maybe I don't feel that way anymore, actually. I feel like maybe the, the, what I used to think of as tokenization is maybe, a, maybe an okay thing. And the reason that I've kind of come around on that is because a lot of the invitations that I get and the sort of opportunities that I get are from members that I have, members of the queer community that I have met, sometimes not even at science um, sort of things, science uh, functions, right? So, um, some of my 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 best friends in in life have come from the queer community um, within AGU. Uh, some of you are on this call. I think you know who I'm talking about. Um, and and y'all have you know helped me immensely, invited me to things, um, had incredible engaging conversations with me about my work and about where my work could head and what's good and what's bad about the sort of approaches that I'm taking, what could be improved, that sort of thing. You know, last summer, um, I was really fortunate to give, I think, one of my favorite public lectures that I've ever given. Um, and it happened to be at a queer um, music festival uh, in the woods. I was invited by a member of the queer community um, who, is a, who is a professor and, and fellow um, techno music aficionado um, in Colorado, invited me to give this talk. And it was, it's to date my favorite talk that I've ever given. And I think the reason is that I was able to deliver that talk to my family, right? Because queer people are my family. I have a, a blood family um, and they're fine. They're great, whatever. Um, but uh, my, my queer family really is my family. Um, and so to be able to speak to you all, for example, on this call, it just really feels like I'm, I'm with family. And so I think in many ways, queer people have, have essentially made my career and I'm incredibly and forever grateful for that, to be completely honest. I will say um, my, my institutional queer family has been the most impactful for me. Um, I know Eli's here. Um, just um, like my institutional experience, you know, it's had its ups and downs, graduate school it has its ups and downs, but having, having queer family here at Auburn um, and being in community with them, you know, celebrating birthdays and graduations and passing exams. And it's just, it's different. It feels, I find just, I don't have to, there's nothing about myself that I have to explain. Like there's so many, there's so fewer questions. Like I, I, I um, came out as non-binary in graduate school and it was just like, okay, like that, it is what it is. Like, there's no, there's no need to explain. I don't need to, you know, I, I don't need to educate myself through, you know, nailing you with all these different questions about what does this mean? And it's just, you know, they took me as I was um, and we move forward and we're still in community, even though we're all, we'll all have graduated by next year. Um, and again, it's just, it's just reaffirming um, because it's, it's, you know, it can be so isolating to be in a, have hold identities that are not the standard right particularly for me as somebody trying to do the work of redefining what the standard is um it's just that 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 community for me is the space where um I don't have to fight it's not a fight nothing is a fight it's peaceful it's love um it's reassurance it's 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 just it's just stress-free and I really am thankful to have had that um, because I know my graduate school experience would be very different if I did not have that. I don't know that I would have continued the work that I'm doing. Um, I don't know that I'd want to, you know, do this work post-graduation, right? Because there's definitely, 
easier things to study in the geosciences than white supremacy and, and racism. Um, but having knowing that I'm supported and knowing that I'm loved and being told that the work that I'm doing by those who get me because they also live this experience, is, it means the world to me. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, uh, I can say prior, you know, I, I, I mentioned that I was out at work um, from the beginning. So I was out as queer um, for eight years before transitioning. And at the time, there wasn't an official NOAA ERG for LGBTQ+. We didn't have very many ERGs, period. Um, and, you know, I think I, I was happy with my career, but I definitely was lacking a sense of community, a sense of connection to my career and to the people, you know, I, I was connected to the people in my immediate office. I have some great people, some great supporters, some great friends there, but there was definitely a lack of some kind of community. Um, and I, I transitioned in 2019 and that happened to be the year that Noah started the official ERGs. And I joined the ERG and since then, it's it's just been an exponential like trajectory in terms of my happiness, my my sense of community, my sense of belonging in my job and my career. I have gotten so many opportunities to develop my leadership school skills also through this through this ERG. Um, you know, I went from feeling like I was happy with my career and I was advancing as in my science and in my technical um, position. And I was happy where I was, but I I had no aspirations past that. I think I wasn't aspiring to be uh, someone in leadership. I wasn't aspiring to be a manager. And now, you know, I'm going into my second year of leading our employee resource group. I'm developing trainings, programs. I'm I'm uh, you know hosting things, uh, joining these panels. Like I've met so many people outside of NOAA and built a huge network. Um, through my engagement with this community. And I, I owe it to the people who have led the way on the ERG to the people that I've met through, um, through this community. And, you know, that's, that's all people inside of work, right? And then there's my community, my queer community outside of work who they're the ones that I rely on for all of my, you know, like for, for so much support and, and growth. They're who I go to, um, uh, for for everything outside of work uh, in terms of my her identity and I wouldn't be I wouldn't have transitioned without them I wouldn't be where I am today uh, and so it's it's been immensely uh, impactful uh, to have community okay thank you uh, getting a lot of really good questions from the the audience right now and Trying to pick, I think I'm going to the the your answer is really focused. I think a lot on your early careers, and I think that really is testimony to how important those experiences and the support groups are around that early career element. And I think that that's really what Maxwell was getting as far as starting out as a, a trans person beginning their careers. Uh, I think we could spend more time, on it, but I want to jump down. I think the next one is a newer, is a new different topic, and I think one that's equally important to the entire group, which is. How can we as allies in the societies best support students and scientists who are currently located in states with oppressive and dangerous legislation targeting the queer community? So how can we support our broader community across the US in, in this somewhat challenging time, still prideful time, but challenging? So I'd like to hear a few thoughts on that if we could. I can start. Um... I'm in the state of Alabama. Um, we are not far behind everyone else um, in in terms of this um, these legislations in question. Um, and I think this the first step is is acknowledging that this is happening, that this is real, um, that this is a real threat, um, that there are real stakes to this. I don't want to call it a game, but these that 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 were more than then it's more than just being used as political pawns, that there are real life outcomes and in some cases life and death outcomes um, for queer people um, in these states. Um, and um, 
with that acknowledgement, because rewinding, silence is not neutrality. Silence is taking a side. Um, being silent on these matters and not saying anything is not the equivalent of, well, I just, I, I'm, I, I don't, I don't have an opinion either way, or I support you, but I don't feel like it's my place to say you not saying anything tells me that you're comfortable with being able to ignore this. Um, and so really to be an ally, to be an advocate, to be an accomplice, to be, to be any form of advocate, really, um, wherever you fall within the spectrum of what you're willing to risk, the first step is speaking up and saying, this is wrong. Um, and I'm here to do what I can, whether that be provide my resources, my time, my energy, uh, utilize my position within the organization, speak up for you to leadership as somebody whose identity is more respected. Um, but I would argue that's the first step is is moving past silence because silence um, silence doesn't silence doesn't do anything for me. Um, it shows me that you're complacent and complacency is complacency is a form of violence. Yeah, thank you, Akila. And I just wanted to add to that that for me, again, loud angry training. Sorry, it goes beyond just talking, um, when queer people, especially trans people right now in this country, and especially trans feminine people actually, um, they're coming for us, right? They are coming for us and it is almost, I mean, it's, you know, I live in Chicago and I'm white, so it's not, I wouldn't say it's dangerous to leave my house every day, but there's, a, there's an element of sort of danger, harm, whatever that can, that can come um, from just being visibly queer, visibly trans. And if you're an ally and you really, really, truly care about the queer community, care about your queer family, care about your queer friends. Um, that means, you know, you need to also put yourself right there in, in harm's way for us. Honestly, it's it's scary, but you have to do it. Otherwise, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, what, what are we doing here? Um, I need you out there and in states that are pushing for this, especially, right? I need you, I need you saying, you know, Approaching it however, you know, feels comfortable to you, but I need you putting putting yourself in the line. I need you to have some stake in this fight, right? That's what I think being an ally means. I will also say for those of you who are queer or are trans are in our inconservative or less friendly places, um, there are queer people everywhere. There are beautiful, incredible queer communities everywhere. It's one of my best Queer friends I met when I was on a field campaign in Namibia, in fact, in Africa, where, you know, technically being gay is still against the law. Um, and to this day, I'm, I still, I, I love him. We talk all the time. He's a great person. Um, and so there, there are queer people everywhere. There are queer, queer people ready to create and foment community everywhere. Um, it's in some places it is harder to find than others, but we're there. Um, keep looking. We'll, we'll make ourselves known. Yeah, I have to agree just second everything that they said. You know, I don't think a lot of people really understand the gravity of, of what's actually happening. So like acknowledging it, learning about what's actually happening, you know, like there, there are laws, for example, that trans people can just be, you know, doing something against the law by entering a state dressed as they normally would and, and day to day. You know, these like tr drag laws or whatnot. Like, this is, this, these are the types of things that are happening. We, they could be, we could be arrested for using a bathroom, for example, which PS, you know, I was born female. You want to send me to a women's bathroom looking like this? That's not going to go over well either, right? Like, I don't know what exactly people are, are, are expecting here, but like, I think it's really important, like Akila said, we need to everyone to acknowledge what's happening and really realize the gravity of all of these things. And uh, you know, like Mika said, also community is everywhere. You can find people; they they are there. Um, and I think uh, you know that's it's just the way that we have to we have to keep fighting. You know, and we've got to get uh, ourselves. We are rallying and fighting against these things. We need every ally, every advocate active and fighting back against all of this stuff. And uh, honestly, we need organizations also to be fighting against all of these things and making sure that the safety of their employees and their students is above all else as well. Because, you know, 
there are people who, for example, may work at a federal agency in a state where this stuff is happening. So what are what are these agencies doing? Like, are they offering accommodations at least to uh, you know make sure that that their employees are safe and uh, yeah. So. Hey, well, <laughs> inspirational, powerful. I'm glad I'm on your team. <laughs> really, really strong messages. Lisa, do you wanna take it back here? Well, I am watching the time. Yep. And I think that to get through another round of questions in one minute would involve all of you speaking for 20 seconds each. And I just don't, it would be insulting because you know there's there's such important messages here, and I love the fact that we we pull together the sort of more formal part of this by talking um, talking about just the importance of the moment we are in in terms of supporting all of our trans siblings, wherever they might find themselves in more friendly places and less funny places, in all the places, as, as you have said. So I think what I'd like to do, Brad, on behalf of you and I, as the sort of two leaders of these large professional organizations that very much do embrace this community, um, can we thank our panelists? But panelists, please don't go away if you can. <laughs> because I know there would be hunger for having some slightly more intimate conversations in breakout groups. So at this point, can I turn it over to Gage or Alejandro or somebody that knows what to do? Yes, uh, Alejandro and I That can, would be Gage. Yeah, yeah, Alejandro and I can take it over. Thank you, um, Lisa, Brad, and, and all our panelists for that really wonderful discussion. Um, we are gonna transition to breakout rooms now. Before I we do that, and, and while things get shuffled in the background, I just wanted to quickly um, share my screen. Hopefully, you all can see this. Um, if you're interested in keeping up to date about some of the events that Coriolis and AGQ uh, sponsor, please follow us on our social media accounts. Uh, for AGQ, you can follow at Queer AGU on Twitter. And then for Coriolis, you can follow AMS Braid. Braid is our board of uh, representation, accessibility, inclusion, and diversity. It's our, our parent uh, committee uh, under which Coriolis sits. So again, please follow those accounts if you're on Twitter to keep up to date. 